I'm sitting here listening to the fireplace sound. I'm thinking it probably would have been better to have ocean sounds. I'm getting an ocean book. In conclusion to the Sunday Fiasco Saga, pausers. Got a new job, pausers. A better job, pausers. Wait, another pancake. I'm smart. I'm not dumb. And then she's like, Um, I wish you too, Toki. Hello. Fireplace sound, indeed. For a uh, ocean themed book, I should have ocean sounds, but I don't. We ignore that. Reason. I think I can do this. Yeah. Dodos. Let's do this. Should work. Bam. It doesn't work. Wait, there it is. The reason. I'm doing this whole reading thing. It's been like three weeks. Lala got me this raccoon bus bookmark. Lala, the biggest juicy. And so I went out and bought books to read on stream because it's the logical thing to do, obviously. Even though Lala isn't here, all I said be the biggest juicy. There's my, there's the book, like the actual book I'm reading, and the raccoon butt sticking out of it. It's just. Yes. In the corner. I can just sit there. I also should have done this in the beginning. Um. this cool book yes it's partially why i bought it because it's a hardcover and um it looked cool i also bought fuck i lost that treasure fuck um these one treasure island it was like why can't i There we go. So much stuff on the screen now. It's beautiful. Yeah, I also got Treasure Island because it looked similar. It was cool. Hold on. I have a thing. There's somewhere. It's almost been 10 minutes or something. Might have hardcover already soft on the inside. Must treat with tender love and care. Very true. A book. Very soft on the inside. Ah, yeah, here it is. Okay. Let me just change. Let me just add a new thing. Yeah. 
There we go. There's Treasure Island. Um, heart the fireplace. I did not. I found it on the internet and shoved it there. Same with the background picture. Yes, we got some very cool books to read that uh, no one sees but me because there's no camera pointing at my hands. But uh, they exist. And I'll just leave this picture here for all to see the raccoon butt that probably won't be noticed. And I should probably get started. I have audacity to record. I have the audacity. Roman numbers time. Alright, um, I want to try and do six chapters. Three days away. These are worse. I should end up in chapter 24. Okay. Just because we randomly did six chapters first and then ship chapters next. And so we're just doing six chapters consistently. I also have to move. So it's right there, because I think that records better. Anyway, I know that was a uh, lot email. That was my brand new one. It has a nice, fun texture on the back, so it's fun to play with. But anyway, continuing with the reading. Uh, I shall start now. Chapter 19, The Island of Vani Coro. This awful sight was but the first of a long series of maritime catastrophes which the Nautilus was to encounter on its course. As long as our ship plowed the more frequent waters we were seeing at intervals, the hull of wrecked vessels rotting in the depths. And in the levels deeper down, we meet every sort of thing that could be fashioned of iron and eaten by rust, cannon, bullets, anchors, chains, and a thousand other naval requisites. On the 11th day of December, we hove in sight of the Aumoto Islands, which Bougainville had called the Dangerous Group. They occupy an area of 500 leagues at east-southeast to west-northwest, from the island of Ducey to that of Lazarus. This cluster is formed of six, six separate groups of islands, among which the Gambier aggregation, aggregation is remarkable, over which France maintains her sway. There are coral formations, slowly raised but continuous in new growths, the creations of the incessant age-long activity of polypi. Throughout the long ages yet to come in the history, of the world, one new island after another will be joined to the neighboring groups, until finally, in the perfection of geological time, a fifth continent will reach from New Zealand and New Caledonia on across the present desert wastes, the Marquesas. Once upon a time, when I was suggesting this new theory of mine to Captain Nemo, he replied coldly, the earth does not need new continents, it needs new men. It was choice alone, I suppose, that had conducted the Nautilus toward the island of Clement Unere, one of the more curious of the group that was discovered in 1822 by Captain Bell of the Minerva. Here I had my long coveted opportunity to study the madriporal system of building, to which the islands in this part of the ocean owe their life. You must not make the mistake of confusing madripores with coral. They have tissue lined with a calcareous crust, and the variations of this structure have led the great naturalist Mr. Mylan Edwards, my worthy master, to classify them in five sections. Animalcule, that the marine polyp polypus secrets live by, the billion at the bottom of their cells, their color calcareous deposits become rocks, reefs, and islands. 
In one place, they form a ring which surrounds some tiny inland lake that communicates with the sea by means of gaps, left there as if by intention. In another place, they erect barrier after barrier of reefs, like those on the coasts of New Caledonia and Aomoto. At another time, they raise up fringed reefs of high, straight walls near which the depth of the ocean is considerable, as at Reunion and at Maurice. Some cable length away from the shore of Fairmont, I admired the truly gigantic work which had been accomplished by these microscopically minute laborers. The walls at which I gazed seemed to be the work of those special magipores, which are known as milliporas, parites, and astray. Yes. These polypi are found particularly in the agitated strata of the sea near the surface, and therefore it is from the upper level that they begin their operations downward, and by degrees bury themselves in the debris of the secretions that support them. Such, at least, is the theory of Charles Darwin, who thus explains the formations of the atolls, and this is, to my mind, a theory superior to that originally ordinarily given of the foundation of Magyaric works, summits of mounts and volcanoes, which are submerged some feet below the level of ocean. I had the chance to observe these strange walls closely. Perpendicularly, they were more than 300 yards deep, and the white sheet of our electric glare lighted this calcareous material brilliantly. And still asked me how long it took to raise such colossal barriers as these, and when I told him that scientists reckoned the process at an eighth of an inch every hundred years, I could see that the poor fellow was properly impressed. Toward evening, Claremont Connery was left far behind us, and now, for the first time, the course of the Nautilus was sensibly altered. After we crossed the Tropic of Capricorn in 135 degrees longitude, we began to sail west-northwest, heading once more for the tropical zone. But although the rays of the summer heat were stifling in their intensity, we did not suffer the least discomfort, as at a depth of 15 or 20 fathoms, the temperature did not exceed an ordinary pleasant mark. On December 5th, we passed to the east the bewitching group of societies in Tahiti, graceful queen of the Pacific. In the morning of the day I named several miles to windward, I beheld the elevated summits of this island. Her waters furnished our table with excellent fish, such as mackerel, bonitos, albacores, and yet here I had the doubtful joy of sampling certain varieties of a sea serpent called Merinophis. On Christmas Day we shot into the midst of the new birds discovered 260 years before by Burroughs, and within a century of our own time, explored by Bougainville and Cook. This group is composed mainly of nine large islands, which form a band of 120 leagues north. north south, south, southwest, between 15 degrees and 20 degrees south latitude, and 164 and 168 degrees longitude. We edged quite near to the island of Aurora, which in the noonday sun looked like a mass of green forest surmounted by a peak of commanding eminence. Ned Land, sentimental chap that he was, seemed to regret most sorely the fact that we did not have a Christmas celebration. The family of which most Protestants are so fond. But I felt it might be folly to suggest the omission to our commander, who had removed himself so completely from terrestrial habits. I had not seen the letter, the latter for a week or so when, on the morning of the 27th, he entered the saloon and acted toward me no differently than if he had parted with me five minutes before. I was at the moment occupied in tracing the course of the Nautilus on the planisphere. My host approached me, placed his finger on a spot in the chart, and said but one word, Veni Poro. The effect of this statement was electrical, for it was the name of those islands on which La Perros had been lost. I rose quickly to my feet and confronted the captain. The Nautilus has brought us to Veni Coro, I demanded. Of course, my dear professor, said the commander, and I have your permission to visit the celebrated islands where the Basol and the Astrolabe struck. Just as you like, Mr. Aronnax. When shall we be there? We are there now. 
I rushed to the staircase and found, and followed by Captain Nemo, mounted to the platform. I scanned the horizon greedily. To the northeast, two volcanic islands emerged from the bosom of the placid sea. They were of unequal size and surrounded by a coral reef that I estimated must be 40 miles in circumference. We're indeed close to Vanicordo, the island which Dumont de Urville gave the name of Island de la Recherche. I faced four square I faced four square the little harbor of Vanua that lay in sixteen degrees four minutes south latitude and hundred sixty four thirty two hundred sixty four degrees thirty two minutes east latitude. Its its soil was covered with verdure from shore to interior summits, and these were crowned by the round diadem of Mount Cabo Capogo, five hundred feet high. My ship easily passed the outer belt of rocks through a narrow strait and found herself among the breakers, where the sea was thirty to forty fathoms deep. Under the abundant shadow of some mangroves, I perceived some naked savages, who, of course, evinced great astonishment at our approach. It was fairly evident to me that in the long black body swimming up between wind and water, there were some. they saw some formidable cetacean, and they regarded us with vast suspicion. Captain Nemo inquired as to what I knew of the wreck of La Peros, and I replied uh, that I knew just what everyone did. And can you tell me the story? He asked ironically. Easily, I said, and here it is. De Urville's account of La Perose's death. In the year 1785, the great commander and his second officer, Captain de Langley, were ordered by Louis the 16th of France on a voyage of world navigation and discovery. Accordingly, they embarked in the corvettes, Vosol and Astrolabe, neither of which was heard of again. Six years later, the French government, uneasy as to the fate of these two sloops, manned and equipped two great merchantmen, the Recherche and Esperance, which sailed from Brest, of, from Brest the 28th of December, 1798, under the command of Bruni. and Tricasto. Two months later, almost to a day, the merchantman learned from Commander Bowen of the Albemarle that the wreckage of foundered ships had been met with off the coast of New Georgia. The Entrecasto saw fit to ignore this information, which was rather uncertain, and directed his course toward the Admiralty Isles, which were mentioned in the log of Captain Hunter as a place where La Perose was wrecked. They sought in this spot in vain. The Esperance and the Recherche had sailed past Vanicordo without putting in, and as the result showed, this voyage was most disastrous for both of them, as it cost de Antricasto his own life and the lives of two of his lieutenants, besides several of his crew. Captain Dillon, a shrewd old Pacific skipper, was the first one to get traces of the wreckage that were unmistakable. On the 15th of May, 1824, he was passing in his ship, the St. Patrick, close to Ucopia, an island of the new Hebbets group. Lascar came alongside in a canoe and told him the silver handle of a sword that bore on its hilt the imprint of engraved characters. The Lascar asserted that six years before, during a sojourn to Vanicordo, he had met two Europeans who belonged to vessels that had run aground on the reefs quite a while before that time. Dylan, of course, at once guessed that the man meant La Perouse, whose disappearance has startled the whole world. He made plans to reach Vanicordo if he possibly could, for there the Lascar swore he would still find debris from the wrecks, but winds and tides prevented Dylan from carrying out his scheme at that time. He returned to Calcutta. There, he managed to interest the Asiatic Society of and the Indian Company in his discovery. A vessel named the Recherche, in honor of its ill-starred predecessor, was put at his disposal. And late in January 1827, accompanied by an agent of the French government, he set out on his quest.
After touching at several port ports in the Pacific, the Dati Recherche cast an anchor before Vanikoro, July 7, 1827, in the very same bay of Vanua where the Nautilus was at present resting. There, just as the last car had promised, Dillon was able to assemble numerous relics of the wreck. Among these were iron utensils of varied kinds, anchors, pulleys, pulley straps, swivel guns, an 18-pound shot, fragments of astronomical instruments, a piece of crown work, and a bronze clock bearing the inscription, Basin Ma Fate. This was the trademark of the foundry at best about 1785. There could no longer be any doubt as to the fate of La Perose's expedition. Dillon remained in the unlucky place until October, making every inquiry and search that his wit could devise. Then he quit Vanikora and directed his course toward New Zealand. He put into Calcutta, April 7, 1828, and from there returned to France, where he was accorded to a royal welcome by Charles X. Now, at the same time, without any knowledge of Captain Dillon's movements, Dumont d'Urville had set out on his own initiative to find the scene of the wreck. He had learned from a passing whaler that several medals in a cross of St. Louis had been found in the hands of some savages at Louisade and New Caledonia. On receipt of this information, Dumont de Urville, commander of the Astrolabe, namesake of the earlier vessel of like title, had immediately sailed, and not quite two months later after Dillon had left Vanicordo, he put in at Hobart Town. There, for the first time, he was informed of Dillon's inquiries, and he found that at certain James Hobbs, second lieutenant of the Union of Calcutta, had seen some iron bars and red stuffs used by natives of these parts. Hobbs had come across them while on an island situated 8 degrees 18 minutes south latitude and 156 degrees 30 minutes east longitude. Much perplexed and not knowing how fully he might credit the accounts he read in untrustworthy journals, Dumont de Urville yet decided to follow Dillon's track. Thus, on February 10, 1828, the Astrolabe appeared off to Copia and took away as guide and interpreter a deserter found on that island. He continued his course to Vanicoro, sighted in the 12th instant, but was forced to lie among the reefs until the 14th. And not until the 20th, because of adverse winds and currents, could he cast anchor within the barrier in the harbor of Vanua. On the 23rd day, several officers made a complete tour of the island and brought back with them some unimportant trifles. The natives, whom they questioned regarding the wreck, pretended ignorance and told more than one evident falsehood, even refusing to lead them to the scene of the disaster. This strange conduct on the part of the savages led the officers to believe that the natives had ill-treated the castaways and were fearful that Dumont de Urville had come to avenge La Perose and his unfortunate crew. Three days later, however, their suspicions lulled by valuable presents and uh, finally believing that they had no cause for fear, they led Mr. Jaquint to the spot of misfortune, and there, in all truth, buried in three or four fathoms of water between the reefs of Kakoa and Manua, lay anchors, cannons, pigs of lead, and iron embedded in the tiny, liney concretions. The large boat and the whaler of the Astrolab were at once dispatched to this place, and not without much difficulty, the crews hauled up an anchor weighing 1,800 pounds, a brass gun, some pigs of iron, and two copper swivel guns. Now Dumont de Urville, on questioning the natives, discovered that La Perouse after both of his vessels had been lost on the reefs of the island, had built himself a smaller boat, but only to be lost a second time. Where? How? No one knew. The French government feared d'Urville might not be acquainted with Dillon's movements, and so it had sent the sloop Aeonais, commanded by Legarrant de Camelin, to Vanicordo. This This sloop had been stationed conveniently on the west coast of America. The Bayonets cast her anchor in the harbor of Vanua some months after the departure of the Astrolabe, but D. Tremillin had found no new document that previous search had overlooked. He was able to state that the savages had respected the monument raised to La Perouse. And that is the end of the story of the wreck of La Perouse and 
that is the substance of what I told to Captain Nemo. So you really think, he said, that no one knows where the third vessel perished, the one that was constructed by the castaways on the island of Anicoro? Yes, that is exactly what I think, I answered. Captain Nemo said nothing further at that moment, but signed to me to follow him into the main saloon. The Nautilus sank several yards below the waves, and the panels were opened. I hastened to the aperture, and at first could see nothing but crustaceans of coral, which were covered with fungi, siphonules, alcyons, and madrepores, and everywhere around were the expected myriads of fish, gyrels, clypistri, comfortides, diacopes, and hollow centers. After a little, however, turning my gaze downward, I recognized her certain debris that the drags of earlier searches had been able, unable to raise. There lay iron stirrups, capstan fittings, cannons, the stem of a ship, all objects that clearly proved the wreck of some vessel and that now were carpeted with living flowers. While I was gazing intently at this desolate picture, Captain Nemo said in a sad voice, Commander Laparos set forth December 7th, 1785, with the ships La Bosol and the Astrolab. They First cast anchor at Botany Bay, then visited the Friendly Isles and New Caledonia. Thereafter, shapes his course towards Santa Cruz and to put into Namoka, one of the Apai groups. Then came the end, for both his vessels struck on the reefs of Coro. The Bosol was went first to attempt an entrance to the harbor and ran aground to the southerly coast. The astrolabe hurried to its aid and likewise stranded. The first ship pounded to pieces almost immediately. The second, lying less dangerously because under the wind, resisted destruction for some days. The natives made the castaways welcome. The latter installed themselves comfortably on the island, and out of the wreckage of two large ships, they built a smaller boat. Now some of the sailors, weary of battling with fate and content with their happy situation on the island, deserted and remained at Mericoro. But others, including all such as were weak and ill, set out with La Perouse. They set their course for the Solomon Isles, and at that place they perished, sinking with everything on board off the westerly coast of the main island of this group, between Capes, Deception, and Satisfaction. Tell me, my friend, how do you know this to be true? By this token, which I found on the spot where the last cast catastrophe occurred. Thereupon my host showed me a tin plate box stamped with the French coat of arms, and much corroded by salt water. He opened the case and I saw a bundle of papers, yellow and mildewed, but readable. They were not other than the instructions of the Minister of French Marine to Commander La Perouse, and in their margins were notes written by the hand of Louis Louis the Sixteenth. Ah, it's a fine fit end for a sailor, said Captain Nemo after a long pause. A coral tomb makes a quiet grave, and I trust that my comrades and I shall find no worse of one. We got a new goldfish named Nemo. Nice named him. Such a lovely name. Lovely goldfish. Buffering. Oh, woo. Okay, hopefully that means the buffering's fixed. I kind of get focused. It's hard to read chat. Hello, Diener. Hope your day is going well. I also remember um, daylight savings happened in some parts of the world, and not in other parts of the world, and did it? Yeah, it did. It didn't happen for us over here. Yeah, this is why daily savings is confusing. So, I typically start 10 p.m. my time. I, I think I was going to say this earlier, but I forgot. I think it's about 10 p.m. my time, which is different times, depending on where you are. I don't have daylight savings. That means I now start an hour earlier if you've gone through daylight savings. And if you haven't done it yet, it's the same time, but if you do it later, it's an hour earlier at some point. So yeah, uh, daylight savings. Confusing. Uh, not really useful. Yeah, we have it way earlier than the US. I see, interesting. 
Confusingly annoying. Exactly. Oh, it's only in the U.S. Unfortunately, it's everywhere. So. And not even all in the U.S. Because I'm in the U.S. I don't do daylight savings. So my time hasn't changed at all. But daylight savings. Very confusing. Things happen when they happen. I guess. Um. Yes. Why not everywhere in the U.S.? Yeah, not everywhere in the U.S. So Hawaii and Arizona don't have daylight savings. So it happens some places. It doesn't happen others. We suffer through it. People get confused. Um, mountain time. Um, mountain time. Kind of, but without the daylight savings. So I'm on a different time than everyone else in Mountain Time, which is lovely and confusing and not very helpful. U.S. too big, too many time zones in U.S. Be both sad, indeed. I'd say they'd be one time. They could be just one time zone. That would mess it up even more. So we just have to live with confusion. I'm living outside of time and space. Uh, perhaps. I live in the walls, so time um, works differently there. And there and space is also wonky. It's like all the walls connect inside to each other on the inside. And so all the walls are connected even if they're in different oh, is Bruno? Uh perhaps. So if you discovered mountain time last year. Yeah. I feel like it's like one of the least known time zones. I feel like people don't really live in the middle of the U.S. Not just the coast. Makes sense. Probably. Globally. Frodo gone to tend to the fur garden. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Not the puns. Anyway, uh, I continue reading the story. That's a big pause. Remember to drink water, folks. It's important to stay hydrated. All right. Chapter 20, The Torah Straits. It was sometime during the night of either the 27th or the 28th of December that the Nautilus left the coast of Vanicordo running at high speed. The course this time was southwesterly, and in three days she had discovered she had covered the 750 leagues that separated from La Perusa's group and the southeast point of Papua. Early in the morning of January 1st, 1868, Council joined me on the platform where I was taking my constitutional before breakfast. Master, will you not permit me to wish you a happy new year? He inquired as he confronted me with a faith wreathed in happy smiles and with out hand outstretched in greeting. Ah, Consul, right, gladly. It is quite as if I were in my Paris study at the Jardin de, de Plantes. I accept your good wishes and thank you for them. Only I must ask you just what you mean by the phrase Happy New Year, which our present circumstances scarcely seem to justify. Do you mean the coming year will see the end of our imprisonment? Or will you still deem it a happy one if it witnesses only the continuation of our strange voyage? On my word, sir, I hardly know how to answer you. One thing is for sure, and that is, we are bound to see curious things. For the last two months, we have had no time for boredom. They say the last marvel is always the most wonderful one, and if we continue this uncanny progression of incidents, I for one cannot imagine how things will end. We can never hope to see the like again if we live to be a thousand and... So, meaning no offense to you, sir, I think the happiest sort of year would be that one in which we could see everything. On January 2nd, I figured that we had made 11,340 miles, or 5,250 French leagues, since our starting point in the Japan Seas. Ahead of us stretched the dangerous shores of the Coral Sea on the northeast coast of Australia. 
A ship at the very moment of my calculations lay some miles distant from the notorious bank on which Cook's vessel was lost in June 1770. The boat in which the redoubtable navigator was sailing struck on a rock, and if it did not sink, this was due to the piece of coral rock that was splintered by the shock of collision, and that became impinned on the broken keel. I had hoped, oh how earnestly, to visit this reef, 360 leagues in length, against which the sea, always rough at this place, broke with great violence, and with a roar like thunder or cannonade. But, as chance willed it, the inclined planes were just then drawing the Nautilus down to a great depth, and I could get no glimpse of the high coral falls. Instead, I was obliged to center my interest upon the different specimens of fish which net the nets brought to us. Among many others, I remarked several German Germans, a species of mackerel with bluish sides and as large as a honey. These fish are striped with transverse bands which disappear the moment the animal loses his life. They followed us in shoals and provided us with a most delicate food. We also captured a great number of gilt heads, fish about one and a half inches long that tasted like dories, and flying parapets, the swallows of the underseas, which on dark nights spend their phosphorescent light alternately on air and water. Among the mollusks and zoo fights, I found in the meshes of the sinus several specimen seven species of Alcinarians, any hammers, spurs, dials, cerites, and alaya. The flora of these parts of the ocean were represented by splendid floating seaweeds, laminaria, and macrocytes, the latter impregnated with the sealage that oozes through their pores. Among them, I gathered an admiral specimen of Nemastoma delinea rufus, which was later placed as a unique specimen among the natural curiosities of the museum. Two days after we had crossed the Coral Sea, January 4th, we hove in sight of the Papuan coastline. It was on this occasion that Captain Nemo told me it was his intention to enter the Indian Ocean by the Strait of Torres. Apparently, he thought proper not to inform me further on the subject, for his communication ended there. Now, the Torres Straits are nearly 34 leagues wide, where they are choked by numberless islands, islets, breakers, and rocks. These render its navigation well nigh impractic impracticable. It would require all the precautions our commander could take to make a successful passage. The Nautilus, floating between wind and water, was forging ahead at a moderate pace. Their propeller, like a cetacean's tail, beat the waves slowly. Profiting by this fact, my two companions and I went up on the deserted platform. Before us was the steersman's cage, and I had every expectation that Captain Nemo himself was in there, directing the course of his craft. Spread out before me, I had the excellent charts of the Strait of Torres, published by that excellent hydrographist, Vincidon Dumoulin. These prints, together with those of Captain King, give the most accurate picture of the intricacies of this vexed ribbon of water, and I studied them minutely. About, about the Nautilus, the confined sea was dashing furiously. The current of the waves that ran southeast to northeast at the rate of two and one-half miles was spending itself in spoon on the coral that showed at intervals. A bad stretch of water, remarked Ned Land. Detestable from any point of view, I said, in hearty agreement. And what is worse, it's a sea that does not suit such a craft as ours. Captain must be certain of his course, for I see right now several pretty pieces of coral that would do for our keel if one of them but should but graze it. Oh, it was a bad situation, there's no denying, but the Nautilus seems to slide by the rocks like magic. We are, of course, not following the roots of either the astrolabe or the zeli, for they had proved fatal. Our line of progress bore more to the northward, skirted the islands of Murray, and then twisted sharply to the southwest toward Cumberland Passage. I thought for a flash of time that we were going to pass by the passage, but no. We swung northwest at a dizzying pace and penetrated a great quantity of islands and islets that are little known, emerging near Island Sound and Canal Mavis. 
I wondered then whether Captain Nemo, momentarily imprudent, would steer his ship into the pass where Dumont d'Urville's two corvettes touched rock, but a third time we swerved marvelously and cut loose straight ahead to the west, steering for the island of Gilboa. I looked at my watch. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. The tide was at its height and presumably was already beginning to ebb. Our ship came so nigh the island, which I can still see in my mind's eye with its thick border of screw pines, that we were standing off a distance of less than two miles. At that instant, a shock threw me to the floor. The Nautilus had just touched a rock and was now immovable, listing lightly to port. By the time that I had recovered from my flurry and risen to my feet, I perceived Captain Nemo and his lieutenant on the platform. They were studying the position of the vessel and exchanging rapid phrases in their incomprehensible dialect. The situation was as follows. Two miles or so away on the starboard side loomed Gilboa, its dark line stretching from north to west like a great outthrust arm. Towards south and east, some coral had begun to show above the water, left high by the receding tide, we had run aground, and in one of those seas where the race of the tide is middling a sorry business, so far as the floating of our craft was at stake, and yet the vessel had not suffered visible damage, for keel was too solidly joined to permit of easy disruption. The problem was then simply this. If the Nautilus could neither glide off nor move by its own power, she ran the risk of remaining forever fastened to these rocks, and then Captain Nemo's submersible would indeed be done for. Such were my sad reflections as the commander approached me. He was entirely master of himself and cool and calm as ever. An accident? I asked, just to say something. An incident, rather, Mr. Aronnax. But one, no doubt, that will force you to become a lifelong inhabitant of the earth from which you flee so industriously. My companion peered at me curiously, and then made a negative gesture with his hand, as if to say that nothing would ever compel him to set foot on terra firma again. Oh, as to that, Professor, the Nautilus is not lost. It shall still live to carry you into the very heart of the marvels of the ocean. Our voyage is but begun, and I do not wish to be so soon deprived of the pleasure of your company. As you please, my dear host, I replied, without appearing to notice the ironic twist of his sentence. Is but the fact remains that your craft has run aground in the open sea. Now the tides are not strong in this part of the Pacific, so unless you can lighten your vessel, I don't see how it will set afloat again. The Pacific's tides are not strong, you are right about that, but on Torres Strait you find, nevertheless, a difference of a yard and one half between the level of high and low sea. Today is the 4th of January, in five days the moon will stand at full. Now I shall be completely off in my prediction if that complacent satellite does not rise, raise this mass of water sufficiently to suit my purpose of flotation. You will thus render me yeoman service for which I shall be much indebted to. On the heels of this speech, Captain Nemo left the platform, and Reed descended with his lieutenant to the interior of our ship, and this vessel was as immovable as if the coralline polypi had already walled it up with their indestructible cement. A penny for your thoughts, sir, said Ned Land, who drifted over my way the moment the commander vanished. They are not worth such a sum, I fear, Ned. I only know we must patiently await the tide of the ninth instant. For I am told the moon will have the goodness to remove us from our peg. Are you joking? No, I really mean it. And this crazy captain is not going to cast anchor at all, since the tide suffices him? Inquired Conseil simply. The Canadian glanced quickly at my servant. Then he shrugged his shoulders most expressively. Sir, he burst forth impulsively, thank you for me that this piece of junk will never navigate again, either on top or under the ocean. It is already fit only to be sold to a dealer in scrap iron at so many cents to the pound. I think, therefore, that the time has come for us to part company with the ship. Not so fast, my friend, I cautioned Ned. I do not despair of the safety of this stout Nautilus. Four days from now, we shall know what trust to put in the Pacific tides. Besides, flight might be a sensible thing if we were in view of the English or provincial coast, but on this unfriendly Papuan shores? No, that is an entirely different matter, and it will soon be enough to adopt that extremity in case our vessel does not recover itself again, which I regard as a terribly serious thing. But look here, sir. Our officers do not understand seamanship enough to act with due caution. And this I do know. There before us is an island. On that island are trees. Under those trees, terrestrial animals roam. These animals are barrows of cutlet and roast beef to which I would, should willingly give trial. 
That seems to me quite right in his contention, observed Conseil. Why could you not obtain Captain Nemo's permission for us to land, if only long enough so that our feet do not entirely lose the power to tread the solid parts of our planet? I can ask him, of course, but he will refuse me. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, said Conseil. Will you please risk it, sir, and then we shall know how far we can rely upon the captain's amiability. Quite to my surprise, Captain Nemo acceded to my timid request without hesitation, and he gave me permission, very politely, not even exacting from me to promise to return to the Nautilus. Still, I should be slow to counsel Ned Land to attempt escape from Durance across New Guinea, for that would be attended with grave peril and hardship. Better to be a prisoner on board the submarine than to fall into the tender clutches of savages. Armed with electrical guns and hatchets, we got away from our craft at eight o'clock the next morning. A slight breeze was blowing on land, but the sea was reasonably calm. Conseil and I sped in a small boat quickly along with our oars, and Ned steered in the narrow passage that the breakers left between them. The boat was well handled and moved like a charm. The harpooner could scarcely restrain his glee. He was like a captive newly escaped from a prison who did not realize that he must sooner re-enter the walls of his cage. Three cheers for meat, he cried joyfully. We'll soon be eating good red meat. And what meat? Real game, if we could only have a bite of bread with it. Ah, I do not say that there is no virtue in fish. Let us not abuse honest food of any kind. But by criminy, a piece of fresh venison grilled on live coals will agreeably vary our ordinary diet. Will it not, little cabbage of a council? Shut up, you gourmand, growled my servant. You are making my rough m mouth water most in unendurably. Let me not be a spoil sport. I said, but really, my friends, it remains to be seen whether these forests are full of game, and also whether the game is not of a kind that will do the hunting with ourselves as the objects of pursuit. Well said, Mr. Aronnax, remarked the Canadian, whose teeth seemed to have become as sharp as the edge of a hatchet, but I am not one to hang back in finick where there's no eating to be done, or when there's eating to be done. I'll eat tiger fast enough, lo loin of tiger, if there are not more savory quadrupeds on this island. Friend Ned grows vastly impatient, said Conseil slyly. You bet I do, said the harpooner, stood it. Whatever the prey is, any animal with four paws and no feathers, or two paws and feathers, gets saluted by my first shot. I'm afraid Land's imprudences are beginning again. I cannot resist saying, for I was growing uneasy. Never you fear, Professor, the Canadian replied, unabashed. I shan't ask more than twenty-five minutes to offer you a dish of the sort I have in mind. At half past eight, the Nautilus's boat ran softly aground in a heavy sand after we had successfully negotiated the coral reef that encircled the island of Gilboa. Take this. Chapter 21 Arcadian Days on Land I was more deeply moved than I expected the moment my feet again touched land. Ned tried the soil with the toe of his boot before he stepped out to take possession of it. Now it was only two months before this day that we had been received on board a submersible to become passengers on it, and yet, to all intents and purposes, we had been prisoners, and none had understood this fact better than we. Therefore, the time had often seemed an eternity. 
Well, in a few minutes after landing, we were a gunshot away from the inhospitable coast. The soil we found was mostly madreporal. Still, certain beds of dried up torrents strewn with debris of granite showed clearly enough that the island was a primary formation. The trunks of the enormous trees attained a height of 200 feet, and they were tied together by ropes and garlands of bindweed, which furnished real natural hammocks that a light breeze was rocking. There are mimosas, ficuses, basurinae, ex, ibisci, and palm trees, mingled together in amazing profusion, and under the shelter of their verdant vault grew orchards, leguminous plants of every description and variety, and ferns. You may believe that the Canadian, however, paid scant homage to these beautiful specimens of Papuan floral. Almost immediately, he abandoned the agreeable for the useful. His eyes lighted upon a coconut tree, and he beat down some of the fruit with his rifle butt. We broke the nuts and ate the meat and drank the milk with a smacking of the lips that spoke volumes as to our dislike of the restricted diet on the Nautilus. I call this bully, exclaimed Ned Land. Excellent, agreed the more complacent Hansiel. You know what? blurted out the Canadian excitedly. I don't believe our captain would object to our bringing a cargo of coconuts back to the submarine with us. I don't think he would object, I said, but he surely would not taste of them himself. So much the worse for him, grinned Council. And all the better for us, asserted Ned Land. There will be all the more for us three. Just a word of warning, my gentle friend, I said to the harpooner, who was already beginning to ravage another coconut tree. This succulent fruit is a wonderful thing, for it would not be wise to take a look around before we load down the canoe with them. Who knows, perhaps the island produces another substance no less useful. Fresh vegetables, for instance, would be mighty welcome on board the Nautilus. You are right as usual, sir, replied Conceal. I propose to reserve three places in our boat. One for fruit, another for vegetables, and a third for venison. I have as yet, Ned, not seen the slightest indication of this meat, despite your ardent boasts. Just don't you despair, my friend, said the Canadian. Let's start on, shan't we? I suggested in my turn. They keep on the lookout. It is true the island seem uninhabited, but it may, after all, contain some individuals who would be less particular than we as to the sort of venison they sought. Oh ho, ejaculated the harpooner, moving his jaws about in a most significant fashion. Why, Ned, demanded Hansel, what are you up to? My word, retorted the Canadian, I'm just beginning to appreciate the delights of cannibalism. What are you giving us? You a man-eater? I guess I can't feel safe with you hereafter, especially since we share the same cabin. I'll wake up some fine day to find myself half-consumed. Don't worry, little cabbage. I'm fond of you, but not enough to devour you if there's any other food going. Oh, I wouldn't trust you around the corner, asserted Council. But one thing is clear enough. We must absolutely bring down some red meat to satisfy this flesh-eater, or someday my master will not find enough pieces of seal left to be of any service to him. While we were working off our high spirits in such chatter, we were penetrating even ever deeper into the somber arches of the primeval forest, and for a period of some two hours we continued to explore our game preserves in all directions, but without tangible result. Chance rewarded our search for edible vegetables, and soon one of the most useful products of the tropical world was furnishing us with a precious article of food that we had sorely missed on board. I mean, of course, the breadfruit tree, which was very plentiful on the island of Gilboa. And I marked down especially that variety of this tree, which is destitute of seeds, and which in Malaya bears the name of Rima. Ned Land, as was natural, knew these fruits well, for he had already eaten many of them on his previous voyages, and he understood how to prepare the edible parts delightfully. The sight of them so excited him that he could scarcely contain himself. Professor, he shouted, I shall die on the spot unless I have a taste of this bread fruit pie. Save your life, dear boy, by eating as much as you want. We are here to make experiments, so why not make them? It will only take... It will take only a jiffy, said the Canadian, and, provided with a lens, he started a fire that was soon crackling merrily. While he was fanning the dead wood to a hotter flame, Cancil and I chose the mellowest fruits of the Artocarpus. Some ears of this had not yet reached a proper state of maturity, and the tough skin concealed a white, fibrous pulp, but others, most of them yellow and gelatinous, were only waiting to be picked. These fruits enclosed no kernel. Cancil brought a dozen... A dozen of them to Ned Land, who placed them on a fire of coals after he had cut them into thick slices. 
During this whole time of preparation, the worthy fellow kept repeating, You'll just see, Mr. Aranex, how good this bread is. Jiminy, but won't it go right to the spot after being deprived of it so long? It isn't even common, ordinary bread either. It's a delicate pastry. Did you ever eat any, sir? No, but I've always longed to have the chance to. All right, then, just get your mouth set for a real juicy meal. If you don't come back for a second helping, I never learned to throw a harpoon. After but a few minutes, that part of the fruit which was exposed to the fire was completely charred. The interior of it resembled a white, soft sort of crumbly paste, and its flavor reminded me of an artichoke. It must be confessed that this bread was of an unusual excellence, and I ate my share of it with savage relish. What time is it now, I wonder, asked Consil, but not, I noticed, until after he had his fill of the fruit. Two o'clock, at least, I replied, after a sight of the inclination of the sun. How time, pl time flies when you're on firm ground, sighed my servant. Let us make quick use of it, then, I suggested. We traced our way back through the forest, along the path we had blazed with our hatchets, as we first walked it. We dawdled a bit to enrich our store of vegetables by a raid upon the cabbage pond, whose fruit we had to gather from the very tops of the trees. We then added to our supply yams of a superior quality and little beans, which I recognized as the abro of the Malays. We were well loaded down by the time we reached our canoe, although Ned Land was grumbling because he did not find our store of provisions sufficient for his greedy mind. In this, as in all else that golden day, fate favored us. Just as we were ready to push off from shore, I perceived several trees that were from 25 to 30 feet in height. There were species of palm tree that bore fruits as valuable as the artocarpus and justly reckoned among the most useful products of Malaya. Malaya. At last, about five o'clock in the morning, we quit the shore. Half an hour later, loaded with our riches, we spoke the Nautilus. No one answered our hail or appeared on board to bid us welcome. The enormous iron-plated cylinders seemed deserted. After I had seen the provisions safely embarked and stored away, I descended to my cabin, and after a hearty supper, slept most soundly. The next day, January 6th, nothing new happened on board. There was not a sound of any kind, nor any sign of life. The boat moored at the side of the Nautilus in the very position in which we had left it the day before. We resolved to return to the island. Ned Land hoped to have better luck with his hunting, and had decided to explore a new portion of the woods. We set off for terra firma at the break of day. The boat, propelled by the waves that were floating shoreward, reached the island in a few minutes. We clambered quickly out to follow Ned Land. Council and I both judged it was wide to yield precedence to the Canadian, whose long legs were already threatening to outdistance us. His path wound up the curving coastline toward the west. He forded several torrents and gained the high plain, which was bordered by admirable forests. Some kingfishers were rambling awkwardly along the water, but proved too shy to permit our approaching them closely. Their caution regarding us proved to me that these birds knew what sort of treatment they might expect from bipeds of our species. I thus concluded that if the island was not actually inhabited, it was at least often visited by human beings. After plodding across a rather wide prairie, we came to the outskirts of a small wood which en was enlivened by the songs and the flight of a great number of birds. Too bad, mourned Consil, whose carnal instincts had been awakened to our journey of the previous day. They are only birds. But I guess you can eat them, can't you? asked the harpooner. I doubt whether you can, my friend, for they are only parrots. Let me show you, little cabbage, said Ned gravely, that to those who have nothing better, parrots taste like pheasants. And, I added, this bird, suitably prepared by parboiling, is worth sticking a knife and fork into. Under the luxuriant foliage of this forest, a world of parrots was flying from branch to branch. It was strange to reflect at this moment that they only awaited a careful education to speak the human language. But as it was, parrots of all hues to the rainbow were chattering away like good fellows. Grave cockatoos appeared to be meditating upon some philosophical problem, the while brilliant red lorries passed us like a stripe of hunting being carried off by the breeze. The ruins of the finest desert colors were also before us, but among all the varieties of winged things so beautiful to behold, there were few that would invite to a feast. One sort of bird which is peculiar to these lands and which has never seemed to pass the limits 
of the arrow into the Papuan Islands, I could not find in this vast collection, but I did not have to wait long to make its acquaintance. After we had bored our way through a moderately thick copse, we came out upon a plain obstructed with bushes. It was there I saw those splendid birds whose long feathers are so arranged that they can fly successfully only against the wind. Their undulating flight, their graceful aerial curves, and the shading of their brightened plumage attracted and charmed our gaze. I had no trouble classifying them without delay. As I lived, I cried, there are our birds of paradise. The Malays carry on a great trade in these birds with the Chinese, but they have several means of snaring them that were at the moment out of our power to employ. Sometimes the Malays place nooses at the top of tr high trees, which frequently defy the birds. Sometimes they catch them with a vicious bird line that paralyzes their movements. They even go so far as to poison the fountains from which the birds generally drink, but we were obliged to fire at them on the wing, a fact which gave us few opportunities to bring them down. And indeed, we vainly exhausted half our ammunition before we surrendered to necessity and quit firing. By 11 o'clock that morning, we had scaled the first range of mountains that traversed the center of the island. We had no booty to show for our pains. Hunger, however, bolstered us up and drove us on. Another time when hunters had relied upon the trophies of the chase to their confusion. Happily concealed to his own vast surprise, executed a double shot and thus secured us our breakfast. He killed a white pigeon and a wood pigeon, which Ned Land cleverly plucked and suspended from a skewer, roasting them before a red fire of dead branches. While these interesting birds were cooking, Ned prepared the fruit of the artocarpus, then the pigeons were devoured down to their very bones, and declared delicious by all of us. The nutmeg with which they are wont to stuff their crops flavors their flesh and renders it delicious eating. Well, Ned, I asked from the depths of my vast contentment, what do you miss most at this minute? Some four-footed game, of course, the harpooner promptly reported. All these pigeons, Mr. Aronnax, are but tidbits and trifles, side dishes at best. And until I have slain an animal with cutlets on it, I shall not be content. Nor I, my dear fellow, until I have my bird of paradise. Let us go hunting, then, advised the practical consul. I move that we work toward the sea. We already we have already reached the first slopes of the mountain, and I think we'd do better to regain the region of the forest. That sounded like sensible advice, so we followed it. We walked for an hour or so and attained the forest of Sago Tree. Several harmless serpents glided away at our approach. The birds of paradise likewise scurried off, and I was despairing of getting close enough for a successful shot. Then Kansil, who was walking along in front, bent suddenly down, uttered a war whoop, and came running back to me with a magnificent specimen clutched firmly in his hand. Ah, bravo, Kansil, I called out to him in greeting. You are very kind to praise me, sir. Not at all. You have executed a wonderful stroke there, my dear boy, to take one of these birds alive, and with your bare hand. Oh, dear master, if you do, if you but examine it closely, you will see that I don't deserve a scrap of approval. Why, how is that? Because this bird is as drunk as a lord. Drunk, and in this natural forest, untrod by man? Positively a fact, sir. It is intoxicated from the nutmegs it has been gorging under the very nutmeg tree where I found it. Behold, Mr. Nedland, the terrible effects of intemperance. By Jingo, exclaimed the Canadian, I hope you're not blaming me for the gin I've been putting away these last two months. If it hadn't been for a pull of strong liquor now and then, I'd have died from boredom on board the old Nautilus. I studied the strange bird that Conceal handed over to me. He was right in his statement. Drugged by the strong juice, the fowl was powerless to fly. It could scarcely stand up on its two legs. It seemed to belong to the most splendid of the eight species that are to be found in Papua and neighboring islands. It was that rarest kind, the large emerald bird. It measured three feet in length from tip to tail, its head was comparatively small, and the eyes were placed near the opening of the beak. They were tiny and bright, like beads. The color of its shadings were beautiful. It had a yellow beak, brown feet, and claws and nut-colored wings with purple tips. It was a pale yellow at the back of the neck and head, emerald hue at the throat, chestnut on the breast and belly. Two horn-shaped downy tufts rose from below the tail that are prolonged by long light feathers of wonderful fineness 
and when one considers the whole plumage of this marvelous fowl, one does not wonder at the native name for it, Bird of the Sun. And so my wishes had been granted, and I possessed the bird of paradise. But Canadian's yearning for venison was still unquenched. It helped things some, of course, when about two o'clock Ned Land shot down a magnificent hog of the species the natives call Berry Oteng. The animal came in time for us to procure real quadruped heat, and he was well received, like the mayor at a, the fair. Our friend was right, proud of his skillful shot, for the hog, struck by the electric bullet, fell stone dead while yet in full flight. The Canadian skinned and cleaned the hog properly after having stripped it of half a dozen cutlets which were destined to furnish us with a grilled repast that very evening. Then the hunt was resumed, and it was still further marked by the exploits of Ned and Council. This came about when the two friends, beating the bushes to startle any chance occupant of them, roused a herd of kangaroos that fled and bounded along their elastic paws. Twist was as was the attempt to escape of these animals, it was powerless against the electrical capsules provided by Captain Nemo. Oh me, oh my, Professor, shrieked Ned Land, transported by the delights of the chase. How they will taste stewed in the pot. What a ripping supply for the old Nautilus. There are two down, three, five by catching. And to think we're going to get our molars into that flesh, and the other idiots on board won't even have a smell. I believe if the good Canadian had not wasted so much effort in babbling, he would have killed the whole lot. But as it was, we were need must content with around a dozen of these interesting marsupians. They were small in build. They were a species of those kangaroo rabbits that inhabit the hollows of trees and are possessed of extreme speed, but they are reasonably fat and offer estimated estimable food, so we were very well satisfied with the result of our hunting. Happy Ned proposed to return to this enchanted island the next day. He was by now determined to depopulate it of all its edible quadrupeds, but he reckoned without his host. Man proposes, but fate disposes. At six o'clock in the evening, we had regained the shore. We found our boat moored where we had left it. We couldn't see the Nautilus, like we could see the Nautilus, like a long rock, emerging from the waves two miles off the beach. Without a moment's delay, Ned Land started to prepare dinner, and he fulfilled our utmost expectations as to his skill in cooking. Grilled upon live coals, the berry otang soon scented the air with a most delicious and salivating odor. The dinner was noteworthy, for besides the hog cutlets, two wood pigeons were added to the menu. Sago pasty atrocarpus bread, some mangoes, half a dozen pineapples, and liquor fermented from the coconuts. These dainties were all there to overjoy us. After the liquor, it seemed to me the ideas of my companions lost in clarity whatever they gained in variety and force. I may be wrong, however. Suppose we do not return to the submarine tonight, suggested Conseil with a yawn of contentment. Say, let's never return at all, said Ned Land. It was just then that a stone fell at our feet and cut short whatever further remark the harpooner may have intended. Okay, water break. We're changing water. Chapter 22 Captain Nemo's Thunderbolt We stared stupidly at the edge of the forest without rising. My hand stopped halfway to my mouth. Stones do not fall from the sky, remarked Conceal, or they would call them aerolites. 
Another storm, more carefully aimed than its predecessor, caused the savory leg of a pigeon to fall from my servant's fingers. This shot added weight to his wise observation. We sprang to our feet, shouldered our guns, and made to reply to any attack. Is it apes, do you think? asked Ned Land. Much the same thing, I answered. It's savages. To the boat, called Council, and set us an example of orderly but hurried retreat. It was high time that we yielded ground, for a score of natives armed with bows and slings were just getting into action. They appeared on the skirts of a copse that masked the horizon to our right, a hundred paces distant. A canoe was moored about sixty feet away. The savages approached us not running, but with such hostile demonstrations that their intentions were painfully evident. Stones and arrows began to fall thick as hail. Ned Land, the obstinate fellow, was unwilling to leave behind him our hard-won provisions, and so, in spite of his imminent danger, with a partly dismembered pig on one side and a cluttering bunch of kangaroo rabbits on the other, he sprinted as fast as he could under the awkward circumstances. In a nod of your head, we were at the shore. In the flash of an eye, we had loaded the boat with our booty and firearms and had pushed it off, with oars already shipped. We had not gone two cable lengths and a hundred savages, more or less, had entered the water up to their waists. The howling and gesticulating were worth going miles to witness. I watched as I sat at the rudder in the stern of our boat to see whether this amazing apparition would attract some of the crew of the Nautilus up to the platform. But no, the enormous machine lying placidly off at a distance was absolutely undisturbed. Twenty minutes later, we were ourselves on board. The panels were open, and so, waiting only to make the boat fast to its moorings, we went down into the submarine. From the drawing room came the sounds of chords. Someone was at the piano organ. There was Captain Nemo, bending forward over the keyboard of the instrument, and caught in a musical ecstasy. Captain, I cried the moment I became aware of him. Evidently, he did not hear me, for he made no response. He did not look up, although I feared the noise of my arrival was greater than I had any notion of its being. Captain, I said again, this time more softly, but touching his hand. He shuddered at my contact with him, and then he turned around and said quite calmly, Ah, it is you, Professor. Well, how did the hunting go? Did you get in any botanizing worthwhile? Yes, Captain. But unfortunately, he rooted out a troop of bipeds whose nearness distresses me. What species of bipeds have you unearthed? Savages, surely. Cannibals, presumably. Savages, he echoed un ironically. Real wild men, were they? Persons who have as yet not enjoyed the manifold advantages of our modern culture and education? Yes, just that. Why are you so astonished, Mr. Arnax, at meeting savages when you set foot on a strange island? Where in all the earth are there not savages? And do you for a moment suppose them worse than any other men, these fellows that you call savages? But you see, sir, how many of their wretched beings did you count? A hundred, at least. The commander placed his fingers back on the organ stops. His polite attention to my words was already waning. Rest assured, Professor, he said idly, that if all the natives of Papua were assembled on the shore, on the shore, the Nautilus would not have a thing to fear from their flimsy salts. The strange man's fingers were now running over the clavier of the beautiful instrument, and I observed with interest that he touched only the black keys, which gave to his melodies an eerie Scotch character. In a moment, he had quite forgotten my presence, and was again buried in a reverie that I had not the heart to disturb. So I stole up again to the platform. Meanwhile, the swift night of the subtropics had fallen, for in this low latitude the sun sets rapidly and without an intervening twilight. I could see the outlines of the island, but indistinctly. Still, the numerous fires lighted on the beach bore mute witness that the savages had no intention of withdrawing from it. I remained in my quiet nook for several hours, sometimes thinking of the natives, but without any particular dread of them. For the calm confidence of the commander in his ship's invulnerability was contagious. But mostly, I forgot the Papuans as I admired the splendors of the southern night. My memories harked back to France, as if in the train of those zodiacal stars which would be shining there in a few hours' time. The moon gleamed in the midst of the constellations of the zenith. The night slipped by without any mischance. I attributed this to the presumable fear of the islanders at the sight of a monster aground in the bay. The panels were open and would have offered an easy access to the interior of the Nautilus. I resumed my vigil on the platform at 6 o'clock in the morning on January 8th. The dawn was already breaking. The island soon became visible through the fog as they dissipated before the sun. First the shore and then the summits. 
Oh, the natives were there, to the tune of five or six hundred, several times more numerous than on the evening before. A group of them, profiting by the low tide, had climbed upon the coral and were entrenched less than two cable lengths from where I sat. I could distinguish them easily. They were typical Papuans, large-figured and of strong race, men with large, high foreheads and white teeth. The woolly hair of a pronounced reddish tinge contrasted sharply with their black, glistening bodies, which resembled the frames of Nubians. Chaplets of bones, whose bones, hung from the lobes of their ears, which were slashed and distended. Most of these savages were stark naked. Among their number, however, I described several women who were clad from the hip to the knee in a sort of wide skirt that was made of grasses and suspended from a waistband of vegetable material. Some of the headmen or chiefs that adorned their necks with crescents and collars of glass beads, and nearly all were armed with bows and arrows and shields, carrying on their shoulders a net which contained the round stones that they cast from slings with great skill. Now one of these chiefs, rather near to the Nautilus, made bold to study it attentively. He was perhaps a motto of high rank, for his body was draped in a mat of banana leaves, notched around the edge, and set off with brilliant colors. I could easily have knocked this native over, he was so close to me, but I thought it was wiser to await the opening of really hostile demonstrations. Not only is prudence the better part of valor, but in parleys between Europeans and savages, it is fitting for the former to ward off sharply, not to attack. During low tide, the natives kept wandering about near the submersible, but offered us no trouble. I frequently heard them utter the word asai, and by their gestures, I understood that they invited me to go to land, an invitation which I declined. So it came to pass that on the third day of our stay near Gilboa, the canoe did not take us away from our ship to the vast displeasure of Ned Land, who wished to complete his store of provender. This adroit Canadian, therefore, found time hanging heavily on his hands, and employed the unexpected leisure in preparing the viands and meat that we had brought off from the island. As for the savages, about eleven o'clock in the morning, as soon as the coral ridges began to disappear beneath the rising tide, they returned to shore. Uh, by this hour, I noticed that their numbers had been considerably swollen by fresh ascensions. The late arrivals had probably come from neighboring islands, or even from Papua itself. Strange that I had not seen a single native canoe. Having no better way in which to occupy my time, I now decided to drag these limpid waters, under which I noticed a profusion of shells, zoophytes, and myriad plants. My determination was strengthened by the fact that this was the last day that our vessel would pass in these parts, in case it really floated off the reef on the morrow, according to Captain Nemo's prophecy. I therefore summoned Consil to my aid, and he procured for me a small light drag, which much like those used in oystery fishery, we went to work with what zeal we could muster, and for a space of two hours we it went to work. Oh wait, we angled unceasingly without bringing to the surface a single rarity. The drag would choke itself full of Midas ears, harps, malaines, and particularly beautiful hammers. And we also brought to light some Olotherians, pearl oysters, and a dozen little turtles that were reserved for the pantry downstairs. But just when I least expected it, I put my hand upon a wonder, I might even say a natural deformity, very merely met with. Conseil was pulling in his drought of di divers' ordinary shells, when all at once he saw me thrust my arm quickly into the net to draw forth a shell. And at the same time, I uttered a conchological squeal that is to say, most piercing cry that human throat can utter. What's the matter, sir? he asked in great surprise. Did you get bitten, sir? No, my boy. My scream was one of undiluted amazement, although I would willingly have sacrificed a finger for the privilege of making such a discovery. But I see nothing wonderful here, sir. Look at this shell, I triumphed as I held an object up for his inspection. But, Mr. Aranax, Conceal continued with a puzzled expression of countenance, you're holding simply an olive porphyry, genus olive order of Pectinibranchidea, class of gastropods, subclass of mollus, mollusca. Correct, dear fellow. You have ticked off everything but the matter most important. The shell, instead of being rolled from right to left, turns from re left to right. Ooh, is it possible? 
It is more than possible, it is so. With rare exception, shells are all right-handed, and when by the billionth chance their spiral is left, amateurs are willing to exchange them for their weight in gold. This fact explains why Consil and I were absorbed in the contemplation of our earthly treasure to the exclusion of all else. I was just making up my mind to enrich the Paris Museum with it when a thrice accursed stone thrown by a native struck against the precious object in Consil's hand and smashed it. I uttered a cry of despair. Consil snatched up his gum and aimed it at the savages who was poising his sling at ten paces from him. I would have stopped my servant, but before I could intervene, his shot took effect and broke the bracelet of amulets which encircled the arm of the savage. Stop it, my boy, I cried. But my heaven, sir, did you not notice that the cannibal was first to strike? No shell is worth the life of a man, I said sternly. The scoundrel, Conceal muttered. I should rather have had him splintered my shoulder. And the worthy fellow was in earnest, too, but I was not of his way of thinking. By now, however, I noticed that the situation of savages had greatly changed during the last few moments where we had been blind. A score of war canoes encircled the Nautilus, scooped out of the trunk of a tree, long, narrow, and well adapted for speed. These boats were balanced by means of a long bamboo pole, or out trigger, which floated on the water. They were managed by skillful, half-naked paddlers, and I watched the advance with a certain trepidation. It's perfectly evident that these Papuans had already had dealings with Europeans and knew their ships, but this long iron cylinder anchored out in their bay, what could they think of it? Fearful things, perhaps, for at first they kept at a respectful distance from it, but little by little they took courage as they saw it stationary and defenseless, and they sought to familiarize themselves with it. Now this familiarity was precisely the one thing I deemed it necessary to avoid. Our firearms, which are noiseless, would produce only a moderate effect on the minds of the savages, which have small esteem for anything that does not roar and bluster. The thunderbolt robbed of its reverberations would frighten man but little, though of course all the danger lies in the lightning and not in the noise. While I was hesitating what to do, the canoes, at a given signal, approached the Nautilus and a shower of missiles alighted her on her. I ran down to the loon but found it deserted. Because of the pressing emergency, I mustered out my courage and knocked on the door opening into the captain's room. Come in, was the answer. I entered and discovered that Captain Nemo was deep in algebraic calculations of X and other quantities. I fear I'm disturbing you, sir, I said, with all the politeness I could summon. That is true, Mr. Aronnax, the commander replied calmly, but I fear you have but I feel you have great reasons for it, wishing to see me. I could wish them less grave, sir. Even at this moment natives are surrounding us in the canoes. In a few minutes we shall certainly be overwhelmed by many hundreds of savages. Oh ho, said Captain Nemo placidly. They have come out in their canoes? Yes, sir. Well, Professor, then we must see to closing the hatches. Exactly, and I came to say to you... Oh, nothing could be more simple, said my calm host. He pressed an electric button which transmitted an order to the ship's crew. And now there is no further cause for worry, he continued after a moment's pause. Everything is all done. The pinnace is in place, the hatch is closed. You do not fear, I hope, that these gentlemen of the wilds can save in iron walls upon which the cannonballs of Abraham Lincoln had no effect? Why, no, sir, but a danger still exists. I wonder. Tomorrow, at just about this time, you'll have to open the panels of the ship to renew the air. Now, if the Papuans should happen to be perched on, a pla on the platform at that psychological moment, I don't see how you can prevent their entering. You think they'll board us, then? I'm morally certain of it. Well, sir, all I have to say is, let them come. The sooner the better. Why should we hinder them from doing what they want to? In a way, I'm sorry for these poor cocoons, and I don't want my unexpected visit at their island to cost the life of a single one of the wretches. What more was there for me to say? I was on the point of departure when Captain Nemo asked me to remain and have a chat with him. He exhibited quite an interest in our excursions ashore, questioned me about our hunting, and did not appear to understand the craving for fresh meat that had seized hold of the Canadian. Thereafter, the conversation turned to other subjects. Without being exactly communicative, my host evinced an unusual amiability. Among a dozen other topics, we came to speak of the situation of the Nautilus, which had run aground at almost the identical spot where Dumont d'Urville had his hairbreadth escape. A propos of this, Captain, the captain said, this d'Urville was one of your really great sailors, a most intelligent navigator, the Captain Cook of France. What an ironical end was his. Did you know that this unfortunate man of science 
After having braved the coral reefs of Oceania and the cannibals of the Pacific, perished miserably in a railroad accident? What do you suppose was uppermost in this man's mind during the last moments of his life? When he spoke in this vein, when his human sympathies were so evidently touched, I always had to revise my opinion of Captain Nemo. Perhaps he really was not so cold-blooded as he wished to appear. With the chart held between us, we reviewed the travels of the famous French marina. He spoke of his voyages into the unexplored parts of the ocean, his two attempts to reach the South Pole, which led to the discovery of the lands Adelaide and Louis Philippine, and of his determining the exact hydrographical bearing of all the principal islands of Oceania. But after all, what your d'Urville did for the surface of the seas, I have done under them. And if my labor is more easy than his, it is also more complete. The astrolabe and the zili, incessantly the playthings of hurricane and typhoon, cannot have the value of my nautilus. Quiet laboratory and workshop that she is, motionless in the heart of the elements she is exploring. What a vivid picture these words raised in my mind. Tomorrow, added the captain as he rose from his chair at twenty minutes to three in the afternoon, our vessel will be afloat, and we shall be leaving the Straits of Torres with a whole skin. When he had uttered these words, the commander bowed to me slightly. This was to announce to me that our audience was at an end, and I returned to my cabin. There I found Conseil, who was most anxious to know the results of my interview. My boy, I said to him pensively, I feel a little as I used to right after my dear mother had administered a spanking to my young person. When I ventured to opine that his nautilus was threatened by the Pahuan savages, the commander answered me very sarcastically. There seems that one thing left for us to do. Put our trust in him and go to sleep with a good conscience. Then you have no further need of me, sir? None, thank you. What is our fellow conspirator Ned Land to? At this very moment, sir, he is constructing a kangaroo pie which promises to be a marvel. And still thereupon left me, and I went straight to bed. But I must confess, I slept indifferently. I heard the hullabaloo of the savages, both in my dreams and in fact. They stamped on the, the platform and uttered deafening cries. So passed the night, so far as I could determine, without disturbing the ordinary repose of the crew. But the ear-splitting relations of these man-eaters affected them no more than the ants that crawled over the front of a mass battery of artillery troubled the soldiers belonging to it. At six o'clock in the morning, I was glad to get up from my couch. The hatches had not been opened, and the inner air was stale, but just as I was finding the atmosphere stuffy and unpleasant to breathe, the reservoirs, filled and ready for such an emergency, were restored to, resorted to, and they discharged the few cubic feet of oxygen that brought new life and zest into the exhausted lungs of the Nautilus. I dressed, but still scarcely knew what to do, so I read in my room until noon without having seen Captain Nemo, even for an instant. On board, no preparations for departure were visible. When the clock struck half past two, I went to the large saloon. In ten minutes, it would be high tide, and if our commander had not made a rash prediction, the submarine would soon be detached from its resting place. Otherwise, many months might come and go ere she could leave her coral prison. Warning vibrations began to be felt in the ship's frame. I could hear the kill grating against the rough, calcareous side of the reef. At twenty-five minutes to three, my host suddenly appeared in the door of the drawing room. Well, we are off, he said, as if announcing departure of a train on schedule time. But I perceive, sir, I have ordered the hatches opened for you. Why, what has become of the Papuans? Why bother about the Papuans? inquired the commander with a slight shrug of his shoulders. But they'll troop right down on us. And how will they accomplish that, may I ask? By leaping through the open panels, I almost shouted. I do not understand this indifferent captain, who is either out of his senses or possessed of some secret knowledge close to me. Mr. Aronnax, Captain Nemo answered quietly, the cannibal cannot enter the Nautilus in that way, even when the hatches are unprotected. I could only gaze at my host in utter silence. He saw the perplexity written in my face. You do not guess, he said. I am stupid, I admit, with no slightest gleam of light. This is the dark room of my brain. Come along with me, then, and I take a look at things. I directed my steps toward the central staircase. Their Conceal and Ned Land were stealthily observing some of the submarine's crew who were opening the panels. Cries of murderous rage, fearful vociferations of bloodlust resounded outside the hatches. The port lids were pulled down. Twenty horrible faces appeared. A rush 
for the iron ladder began. But the first native who placed his hand on the stair rail was struck from behind by some invisible force that I could not figure out. He fled as if he were pursued by the devils of the underworld, howling, making the wildest contortions. At least ten of his comrades had followed in his footsteps. They met with the same strange fate. Conceal was hugging himself for joy, but Ned Land, carried away by his more violent instincts, rushed to the staircase. The moment he seized the railing with both hands, he in turn was overthrown, as if shot down from a catapult. A thunderbolt hit me, he cried, with an awful oath. This explained all to me. There was no railing in the proper sense upon which hands had been put, but a metallic cable that was charged with electricity from the deck and connected with the platform. Whoever texted got a powerful charge of juice, and the resultant shock would have been a mortal one if Captain Nemo had entrusted to the conductor the whole force of the ship's current. It might be truly said that my host had stretched between himself and his assailants a screen of electricity which none could pass with impunity. Meanwhile, the Papuans had beaten a swift retreat, paralyzed with terror. As for us, we laughed ourselves half sick and then went to work to console poor Ned Land. What we needed and massaged him, he swore like one possessed. It was then that the novelist, raised by the last waves of the tide, quit her coral bed. Almost unconsciously, I cast a glance at the clock. The hands indicated twenty minutes to three. It was the exact instant promised the previous day by the captain. Her screw beat the water slowly and majestically. Her speed increased gradually, and sailing on the surface of the ocean as calmly as if she had never met She had never met with a disagreeable experience in all her days. The submarine quit safe and sound the dangerous passes of the Torres Straits. Hello, Lala. You are the biggest cutie, Lala. It do be facts. To be be facts indeed. Oh, Tom, you're the super cutie. No, no, no. That was lies and slander, as indicated by uh, stream elements. Stream elements, no sorts of. I love stories, how I'm I'll catch up with the pod. Uh, yes, I'll keep my mental health stuff. But yes, I'll do that. This is why I'm recording it. Hopefully, it shouldn't take too long, I say, as it's like an hour. Also, I don't know when daylight savings happens for you, but it's happened in America. So times may become confusing. Daylight you know, savings is such a pain. Yesterday? Alright. I didn't think it would start yesterday. Or it would end yesterday. I don't know how daylight savings work. It happens and I cry about it every single time. Or I am constantly confused despite numerous readings about how it works. The Americans doing daylight savings, I know, it's so silly. I wish it were gone, Day as I don't do that. It just makes everything all the more confusing. No one knows what time it is. We lose random amounts of sleep. And it's done. Uh, yes. We're almost done. I think we got two more chapters. This is what? Yeah, this is 23. We're gonna end on Six chapters. Are done. Chapters do seem longer, I feel, though. Which I guess makes sense. But I guess, which is, huh, interesting. But yes, I drink water. And everyone else should drink water, too. Because hydration is important.
I shall, I'll save this thing. And I shall continue. Chapter 23, Confinement. Next day, January 10th, the Nautilus continued her passage between the two seas, but with what a difference. She was not moving at so remarkable a speed that I could not estimate it at anything less than 35 miles an hour. The rapidity of her screw was such that I could neither separate nor count its revolutions. I reflected upon the marvelous qualities of the agent that drove our vessel. It afforded her motion, light, and heat. It transformed her into an ark of safety and protected her from assault. No profane hand might touch her without being smitten by the lightning. My admiration for this agent was unbounded. It extended to the engineer who had harnessed this force to his purposes. Our course was directed toward the west. On the 11th of January, we doubled Cape Wessel, which is situated 135 degrees longitude and 10 degrees north latitude. This promontory forms the eastern point of the Gulf of Carpentaria. The reefs were still numerous, but now they were more regular in formation and marked on the chart with extreme precision. The submersible easily avoided the breakers of money, which lay on the port side nor did she have the least trouble with the Victoria Reefs, which lay to starboard at 130 degrees longitude, and on the 10th parallel, directly on our course. On the 13th of January, Captain Nemo arrived in the Sea of Timor, and recognized the island which bears the same name in 122 degrees longitude. From this point, the direction of the Nautilus shifted to the southwest. Her head was set for the Indian Ocean. Where would the whim of our commander transport us next? Futile as speculations on this point might be, when I was unacquainted with any ruling purpose in his actions, I yet could not dismiss them from my mind. Would he return to the coast of Asia? Would he approach the shores of Europe? Both of these seemed improbable, conjectures in connection with a man who fled from inhabited continents. Would he then descend to the south? Was he going to double the Cape of Good Hope, then Cape Horn, and finally penetrate to the Antarctic Pole? And in the end, would he return to the Pacific, where his vessel could sail freely and independently? Time alone would show. Meanwhile, we skirted the shoals of Artir, Pepernia, Seringapetum, and Scott. These were the last bulwarks of the solid element against the encroachments of its liquid counterpart, and on January 14th, we lost sight of land altogether. The speed of the Nautilus was then considerably abated, and her course of action became quite irregular. He sometimes swam amidst the depths of the sea, and others floated on the surface. It was during this part of the voyage that the commander made interesting experiments on the varied temperature of different levels of the sea bottom. Ordinarily, such tests are made with complicated instruments, and the results are fairly doubtful. They used the thermometrical sounding leads, the glasses of which frequently break because of the pressure of the water, or they resort to an apparatus which is based on the differential resistance of metals to electric current. And calculations so arrived at cannot be trusted. The Captain Nemo himself descended to test the temperature in the depths of the sea, and coming as he did in direct communication with the levels to be measured, he secured immediately and accurately the degrees sought, either by overloading her reservoir tanks or by sinking obliquely by means of her inclined planes. The Nautilus was thus able to attain successfully depths of three, four, five, seven, nine, and ten thousand yards. The definite result of his observation was that the ocean maintained an average temperature of 4.5 degrees centigrade in all latitudes at a depth of 5,000 fathoms. On January 16, our submarine seemed to be calmed only a few yards beneath the surface of the, wa of the waves. Her electric machinery was out of commission, and her inactive screw permitted her to drift at the whim of the wind and current. I imagine the crew might be occupied with interior repairs made necessary by the strain to which the engines had been put. Then it was that my companions and I witnessed a curious spectacle. The panels of the saloon were open. A dim obscurity prevailed in the midst of the sea because the beacon light of the submarine was not in operation. It was interesting to observe the sea under such conditions. The largest fish appearing to the eye, no more than scarcely defined shadows. Suddenly we found ourselves transported into full light. I thought at first, of course, 
that the beacon had been lighted and was again casting its electric radiance into the waters. I was mistaken and after a rapid survey perceived my error. The Nautilus was floating in the midst of a phosphorescent mass, which, because of the gloom elsewhere prevalent, became quite dazzling. The bright glow was produced by myriads of luminous anemoculi, whose brilliance was somehow increased as they glided over the hull of the vessel. I was amazed I was amazed to see a sort of lightning in the center of these luminous sheets, as if rivulets of lead had been melted in a fiery furnace, or metallic masses had been brought to a white heat. So that, by force of contrast, certain portions of this lighted matter appeared to be casting a shadow in the very midst of the general ignition, from which it seemed as if all shadow should be banished. Ah, no, this was not the ordinary irradiation of summer lightning. This was unusual burning and vigor. This was truly living light. Whence did it come? Why? It was in reality an almost infinite agglomeration of colored infusoria and globules of diaphanous jelly, which were provided with thread-like tentacles. As many as 25,000 of them had been counted in less than two cubic half inches of water, and the light was multiplied by the glimmering peculiar to Medusa, the starfish, Aurelia, and other phosphorescent zoophytes, impregnated by the grease of organic matter decomposed by the sea, and perhaps the mucus secreted by fish. For a long while, the submersible floated in these brilliant masses, and our wonder was increased as we watched the marine monsters disporting themselves like salamanders. I saw there, for instance, in this glow that does not diffuse heat, a swift and graceful porpoise, who is indefatigable clown, who is the indefatigable clown of the ocean, and swordfish ten feet long. Those prophetic heralds of hurricane and tempest, whose formidable sabers but now and then great against the glass of the saloon. Then appeared smaller fish, the variegated ballista, the leaping mackerel, wolf thorn tails, and a hundred other sorts that struck the luminous element through which they swam. The dazzling scene was enchanting, very likely some atmospheric condition of the unusual kind increased the intensity of this phenomenal brilliance. Perhaps some storm agitated the upper surface of the waves, but at the depths in which we lay, the Nautilus was unmoving by its fury and reposed peacefully in the still water. Thus we journeyed on from one new marvel to another. The halcyon days glided swiftly by, and I scarcely took account of them. Council arranged and classified his zoophytes, his articulata, his mollusks, and his fish. Ned never tried of ni Ned never tired of inventing new dishes in order to vary to the utmost diet on board. We were growing fast to our shell like snails and I swear it must be easy to lead a snail's existence. Thus our undersea life began to seem no natural to us, and we no longer thought of the days we used to spend on land. Then, without warning, something occurred to recall to us most vividly the strangeness of our position. On January 18, our ship was in 105 degrees longitude and 15 degrees south latitude. The weather was threatening the sea. The weather was threatening. The sea was rough and rolling. There was a strong wind from the east. The barometer, which had been falling for some days, gave notice of an impending storm. Chance had it that I went up the platform just as the second lieutenant was taking the measure of the horary angles, and according to my habit, I waited for the usual phrase to be said. But on this day, the customary words were not uttered. They were replaced by another sentence equally incomprehensible. Almost at once, I saw Captain Nemo appear and look at the horizon through a telescope. For several minutes he was immovable, never taking his eye from the point under observation. Then he lowered his glass and exchanged a few words with his lieutenant. This man seemed to be the prey of some emotion which he struggled vainly to repress. Captain Nemo, who had command over his feelings, remained cool. He seemed to be objecting to what the lieutenant said, while the latter kept replying in an emphatic and assured fashion. At least that was what I deduced from their tones and gestures. Naturally, I also gazed carefully in the direction indicated, but without seeing a blessed thing. To my eyes, no object intervened between the platform and the point where sky and water merged in the clear line of the horizon. Our commander, however, strode from one end of our deck to the other without looking at me, perhaps without seeing me. His step was firm, but less regular than usual. Sometimes he would stop in his walking, 
crossed his arms and again studied the expanse of the ocean. What in the world could he be looking for in that vast desert? At that time, the Nautilus was hundreds of miles from the nearest coast. The lieutenant had glassed the telescope and was now examining the horizon imminently. He walked rapidly about and he stood still. He stamped his feet nervously now and then without realizing what he was doing. Altogether, he exhibited much more agitation than his superior officer did. At any rate, this mystery, whatever it might be, would necessarily be explained. And before long, for consequent to a command of Captain Nemo's, the engine had vastly increased its propelling power and was making the screw hum. The second officer touched the commander on the shoulder to attract his attention. The latter halted abruptly and directed his gaze to the point indicated by his companion. He looked long. All this mummery was getting to be too much for me. I rushed down to the drawing room and secured the telescope that I was in the habit of using. It had an unparalleled set of lenses. Then I returned to the upper deck and leaned to steady myself on the cage of the watch light that jutted out from the front of the platform. I controlled as best as I could the nervous shaking of my right hand and set myself to the task of examining the whole long line of sky and sea. My eye had scarcely adjusted itself to the end of the glass when the instrument was quickly and rudely snatched from my hands. I turned around. Captain Nemo stood before me, but I did not recognize him in his present guise. His face was as if transformed. His eyes regarded me with a sullen flash. His teeth were set sternly together. Every indication betrayed the violent emotion that pervaded his whole frame. Stiff body, clenched fish, head shook down between his shoulders. He was immovable as marble, flint, adamant. My glass fell almost unnoticed from his hands and rolled to his feet. Was I the object of his anger? Did this incomprehensible being fancy that I had discovered his long hidden secret? No, quite evidently not. It was not I who had provoked his convulsive passion. He was not looking at me. His eye was steadily fixed upon the impenetrable point of the horizon. At last, Captain Nemo recovered himself. His agitation visibly subsided. He addressed some words in the foreign language to his lieutenant that returned to me. Mr. Aronnax, he said in a rather imperious tone, I ask you now to respect one of the conditions which bind you to me. Which one of them, my host? You must be at once confined to your cabin, together with your companions, until I see fit to release you. This decision rests with you, sir, according to our agreement, but, I may, but may I ask you one question? Not one. I demand instant obedience. There is no re resisting this injunction. It would have been useless to have attempted delay, so like a whippet child... I went down to the room, occupied by Ned Land and Consul, and told them of the unexpected turn of affairs. You may judge how my communication was received by the Canadian. Words fail me to convey the picture. But there was no time for arguing. Four of the crew were already at the door, bent upon our immediate confinement. They led us in silence to the cell in which we had passed our first night on board the Nautilus. The harpooner was just making up his mind to a demonstration of force when the door was slammed in his face and locked. I'd rather like to know the meaning of this, Conseil confided to me with his habitual phlegm. I told my comrades what had passed. They were as much puzzled as I by the mystery of the thing, and equally at a loss as to how to account for it. Soon after our imprisonment, I grew absorbed in my own reflection. The strange look of fear on the face of our commander took precedence of my other memories as I reviewed the scene on the platform. It was so little in consonance with my whole pre previous idea of the man. My thoughts were briskly interrupted by Ned Land. Hello, hello. Breakfast is now served. And as sure as Eve ate apple, the tables were set and ready for us. Captain Nemo, remarkable man, had forgotten nothing. At a flash, he must have conveyed three orders. To lock us up, to feed us, and to send the Nautilus full speed ahead. Will you listen to his suggestion for me, sir? inquired Consul mildly. Say whatever is on your mind, my lad. Let's eat breakfast, sir. You never know, sir, what is going to happen, and I am brave as a lion when I'm fed. You are quite hopelessly sensible, Consul. Dingo, said Ned Land, pulling a long face. There's nothing here but the ordinary ship's bill of fare. No cutlet, no roast, no bread, pie, pudding, no vegetable, no sauce. Fish, fish, fish. Neddy, Consul demanded. What would you have said if there had been no meal at all? There was no answer to this argument. The harpooner ceased his recriminations and set to work and did not miss a bite. The repast was eaten in silence. There was so much to say that we said nothing. Scarcely had we finished eating when the luminous globe that lighted our prison cell was extinguished. The land was soon asleep, quite audibly so. What really astonished me was that Conseil followed his example, not even omitting to snore like a good fellow. 
I was wondering what could have caused such irresistible drowsiness when I felt my own brain becoming dull and stupefied. A painful suspicion entered my mind. A sleeping powder had been administered to us in the food that we had just taken. Apparently, our imprisonment alone was not sufficient to conceal the captain's plan from us. Sleep was also necessary. I, I fought against the influence of the, the porphyric medicine. The swaying of the sea, which had caused a slight rolling motion in the Nautilus, had ceased. Did this mean that we had hunted the depths of the ocean, that we returned to the quiet bottom of the waters? It was impossible for me to withstand my increasing drowsiness. My breath came more faintly and in gasps. I felt a mortal chill steal along my rigid and half-paralyzed limbs. My eyelids fell as if they had been capped with lead. I tried to open my eyes. No, a morbid sleep, full of hallucinations, nightmares, bereft me of my senses. Then the visions must have disappeared, for I was suddenly left in a state of complete insensibility. That was interesting. All right, time for the final chapter of the night. I have to think if he had it's that's part two after this, which is. But I shall continue. Chapter 24, The Realm of Coral. Coral. The next morning, I awoke with a head singularly clear. Whatever narcotic had been given to me the night before, it caused me neither headache nor nausea. To my bewilderment, I was in my own room. This led me to believe that my companions had likewise been returned to their proper births without any more consciousness of the fact than my own. They would then be as ignorant as I regarding the happenings of the night before, and therefore, to pierce this mystery, I could reckon only on what the future might bring forth. I threw on my clothes and decided, if possible, to quit my room. Was I again free or captive? Quite free, apparently, for the door opened to my hand, and I went up the central stairs. The panels that gave on the upper deck were unlatched, and I stepped out on the platform. Until and Ned Land were waiting for me there. I questioned them. They could tell me nothing. Like myself, they had been buried in, in a sleep far beyond even passing consciousness of events. They had been amazed to wake up in their own bunks. As for the Nautilus, the old ship seemed as quiet and mysterious as ever. It was floating idly on the surface of an, un, of an even sea, at a pace so moderate as hardly to indicate progress. Nothing seemed changed. The second officer appeared on the platform, regular as a marionette operated by clockwork. Nor did he emit the usual order for my retirement. But Captain Nemo was nowhere about. Of all the people on board, I came to see only the impassive steward who served me at the table with his accustomed dumb civility. About two o'clock that afternoon, I was in the drawing room, busied with my notes and the arrangement of certain writings, when my host, when my host suddenly entered. I bowed to him, and he made a slight inclination of his body in return without speaking. I went back to my work, hoping against hope that he would vouchsafe some explanation of the events of the previous night. He made none. I studied him narrowly when I felt sure he would be unconscious of the scrutiny. He seemed to be fatigued. His heavy eyes had not been visited by refreshing sleep. His face wore a sorrowful expression. He fell to pacing the room. He sat down, rose again. He took up the nearest book, put it down, and read. He consulted his instruments, but took no note of their indications. He was restless, uneasy. At last he came to where I sat and said, Are you a doctor of medicine, Mr. Aronnax? The query was so utterly unexpected that for some time I stared at him stupidly and in silence. I thought it likely, he continued. A number of you naturalist fellows have studied medicine and surgery. It happens that I am a physician and still resident surgeon to the general clinic in Paris, I managed to say. I practiced several years before going to the museum. That's a piece of good fortune for me, Professor. My answer had evidently satisfied the commander, but as I had no idea what he would say next, I thought it best to wait for possible further questions before I offered my services. In short, Mr. Ernax, 
Would be good enough to prescribe for one of my men? If I ascertain the nature of his illness, certainly. Will you please come with me now? I follow, sir. My heart began to beat strangely. I do not know why I sensed the direct connection between the injury to one of the ship's com company and the events of the day before. And the mystery, I am afraid, interested me at least as much as the case of my patient. Captain Nemo conducted me to the poop of the Nautilus. He took me into a cabin situated near the sailor's quarters. There on the bed lay a man, some forty years of age, of a resolute type of countenance, the true embodiment of Anglo-Saxon. I leaned over to examine him. Ah, he was not only sick, he was wounded. Swathed in bandages covered with blood, his head was motionless on the pillow. I undid the wrappings, and the injured man looked at me fixedly with his large eyes, giving no sign of pain as I worked gently at his dressings. It was a horrible wound that I exposed. The skull had been shattered by some deadly weapon, and the brain, much injured, was left largely exposed. Clots of blood had mercifully, mercifully formed in the bruised and broken mass, in color like the dregs of burgundy wine. It was, of course, both contusion and suffusion of the brain. The poor fellow's breathing was slow. At frequent intervals, his face was distorted by the spasmodic twitching of his muscles. I felt his pulse. It was intermittent. The extremities of his body were already growing cold, and I saw that death must shortly await and inevitably ensue. After I had dressed the sufferer's wounds as best I could, I readjusted the bandages to his head and turned to Captain Nemo. What caused the wound, I asked. That's neither here nor there, he replied evasively. A shock broke one of the levers of the engine. I was struck too. But your opinion, sir, as to his condition. I hesitated as to what to say. You may feel free to speak, said the commander. This chap does not understand French. I gave a last look at the wounded man. He will be dead in two hours, I said. Can nothing save him? Nothing, sir. I saw Captain Nemo clench his head. I noted the tears glistening in his eyes, which I had thought incapable of shedding them. For a little while, I lingered at the bedside of the dying man, whose life slowly ebbing away. Under the electric light that shone so strongly upon his deathbed, his pallor increased. I regarded the intelligent forehead, which was furred with premature wrinkles, caused doubtless by misfortune and sorrow. I would gladly have tried to learn the secret of his life from the final words that would escape his lips. You may go now, Mr. Aronnax, my host mildly suggested. I left him in the dying man's cabin and returned to my room, most unprofessionally affected by what I had seen. During the whole day that followed, I was haunted by uncomfortable suspicions, and at night I enjoyed but a fitful sleep. Amid my broken dreams, I imagined I heard distant sighing and something like a funeral hymn. Would they prayers for the dead, uttered in a language that no man might understand except he be initiated in its special usage? The next morning, early, I ascended to the bridge. Captain Nemo was there to receive me. The moment he saw me emerge from the open hatch, he came toward me. I wonder if it will be convenient for you to make a submarine excursion with me today, excursion with me today, he asked. With my companions, sir? If they like. We are at your disposal, sir. In that event, Professor, will you put on your cork jacket on your cork jacket and ask the same of them? I was only glad that here there was no question of dead or dying. I rejoined Ned Land and Council and informed them of our commander's proposal. My servant hastened to accept it, and for once, in a way, the Canadian was not averse to following his example. It was eight o'clock in the morning when the decision to go was made. Half an hour afterward, we were equipped for this new excursion and provided with two contrivances for light and breathing. The double door was opened, accompanied by Captain Nemo and a dozen of the crew. We set foot at a depth of about 30 feet on a solid bottom where the Nautilus rested. A gentle slope led us to an uneven ground at some 15 fathoms depth. The soil differed entirely from the one we had visited on our first trip under the waters of the Pacific Ocean. Here there was none of the fine sand, no submarine plains, no sea forest, but I recognized at once the marvelous sort of region where, on that day, the captain did the honors to us. It was the Coral Kingdom. I was interested to see in their proper home the Gorgonia, the Isidii, and the Corollariae, and the Alcyon class of the Zoophytes. The light produced a thousand delightful harmonies as its rays played amid the branches that were so vividly colored. This gave the illusion that the membranes and cylindrical tubes of coral were trembling at the undulation of the waters. I felt sadly 
tempted to gather the fresh petals of the zoophytes that were adorned with delicate tendrils, some in their first budding, others but recently full-blown. Small fish of every sort, swimming swiftly, came into gentle contact with them, as flights of birds would graze the flowers in an earthly meadow. When, however, my hand would only approach these animate flowers, the whole sensitive colony of them would take alarm. White petals would re-enter their red cases. Flowers would fade while I looked, and the flourishing bush would transform itself miraculously into a mass of stony knobs. Chance had brought me to a neighborhood where the most precious specimens of zoophytes are bred. The coral before me was more valuable than the kind found in the Mediterranean, on the coast of France, or of Italy in Barbary. Its names, flowers of blood and froth of blood, were justified by its tints. In the trade, coral is sold for $100 an ounce. What a fortune the watery beds of this place would make for a company of coral divers. But soon the space devoted to bushes contracted in an, an area, and the arborizations increased. Real petrified thickets, long arcades of fantastic design, opened out before us. Captain Nemo guided us down under a dark gallery of such joists, where a sloping of incline led us to a depth of a hundred yards. The lights from our lamps adduced effects more magical than those in the transformation scene of a Christmas extravaganza. The bright rays threw into bold relief the, the rough outlines of the natural arches, and tipped with points of fire the pendants that hung from them like lustrous candelabra. Among the coralline shrubs I noticed other polypi, scarcely less curious. The lights and irises with articulated ramifications, also some tufts of coral, green or red, encrusted like seaweed and calcareous salts, which naturalists, after prolonged and heated discussion, have definitely assigned to the vegetable kingdom. Is this perhaps the real point where life rises obscurely from the sleep of a stone without quite detaching itself from the rough point of departure? We continued our submarine stroll for two hours. By that time, we attained a depth of 300 yards, which is the extreme limit on which coral begins to form. But we found no isolated bush, no modest brushwood or undergrowth. At the foot of these lofty trees, it was a huge forest of large mineral vegetations in which we had come to wander. These petrified trunks were enormous, and they were bound together by garlands of elegant tumaris or sea bindweed, and all adorned with lace-like clouds and reflections. We passed freely beneath the high branches which were lost in the shadows of water, while at our feet cubipores Meandrines, stars, fungi, and caryophyllidea formed a carpet sown with dazzling gems. What an ineffable spectacle. Captain Nemo had halted at last. My companions and I came to a standstill, and as we turned around, we noticed that his men were forming a semicircle about their chief. On close inspection, I observed that four of the crew were carrying on their shoulders an object of oblong shape. We were occupying at this moment the center of a vast glade, shut in on every hand by the lofty foliage of the undersea forest. Across this open space, our lamps cast a sort of lucid twilight that singularly elongated the shadows on the ground. At the edge of the clearing, the darkness rose against us like a wall, relieved only here and there by little sparks refracted by the points of coral. In the midst of the glade, on a pedestal of rocks roughly piled up, stood a cross of coral. I might have thought its long, extended arms were forms of petrified blood. On observing the ground more closely, I saw there was raised in certain parts by slight mounds that were encrusted with limey deposits. These ridges were located with an ordinary, an orderly regularity that betrayed the hand of man. Conscious that they were about to witness a strange scene, Ned Land and Consul drew close to me, and aside from Captain Nemo, one of the crew advanced, and at a distance of some feet. From the cross, he began to dig a hole with a pickaxe that he detached from his belt, and it all was suddenly clear as crystal to me. The glade was a graveyard, this hole a tomb. The oblong object was the body of the man who had passed away during the night. The captain his man, and his men had come to bury their dead companion in this unworldly cemetery at the bottom of the inaccessible ocean. The grave was dug but slowly, and the fish fled in all directions while the solitude of the retreat was being thus violated. I listened to the thudding strokes of the pickaxe, which sparkled when it hit upon some flint lost at the bottom of the waves. The hole was soon large and deep enough to receive the corpse. Then the water, then the bearer slowly drew near. The body, enveloped in a tissue of white, was lowered into the watery tomb. 
Our commander, with arms crossed on his breast, knelt in prayer, and all the friends of him who had loved him of them did the same. The grave was then filled in with rubble taken from the ground, and a slight mound was thus formed. When this had been done, the captain and his men rose from their knees. Then drawing near to the grave, they again knelt and all extended their hands in a gesture of final farewell. Thereafter, the funeral procession returned to the Nautilus, passing again under the arches of the forest, through the mists of the thickets and the long stretch of coral bushes, uphill all the way. Finally, the lights on board appeared, and a luminous track guided us back to the submersible. By one o'clock, we were inside. As soon as I exchanged my clothes for ordinary garments, I went up to the platform. A prey to conflicting emotions, I sat down near the binnacle. Captain Nemo joined me shortly after. And the poor man died in the night, as I prophesied, I asked. Yes, Mr. Aranax. And now, near his comrades of earlier days, he is at rest in the Coral Cemetery. Forgotten by all else, but not by us, Professor. We dug the grave for him, and the polypi undertake to seal it for eternity. The commander buried his face quickly in his hands, and strove in vain to repress his sobs. Then when he could control his voice again, he continued, Our peaceful cemetery is there, some hundred feet beneath the water of the waves. The dead indeed sleep quietly, Captain, out of the reach of sharks. Yes, sir, out of the reach of sharks and men, gravely replied my host. That was kind of sad and kind of sudden. That will be the end, kind of a sad note. Also, after this, it's part two and restarts the chapter numbers, so that'll be interesting. Probably have to make note of that when I start reading it out. said part one. It did, and I wasn't. I'm sure it's fine. Surely. Um, we can go here. No. Yes. Yes, that is the end. Today's reading session. Another six chapters down. Slowly but surely getting through the book. Thank you for the story, Tom. Thank you for coming. Glad you were enjoying it. Enjoying it a lot. Like, in hindsight, it's maybe kind of strange that I'm reading a book on Shane that I haven't read before. So I'm like discovering it as we go. But surely that makes it more fun. Yes, indeed. We shall run away, we shall scurry off and raid someone, probably Aaron, who is out there chug-jugging pilk, which is a fascinating sentence to behold. Yes, thank you all for coming. Again, next week, I want to say same time, not really same time. Daylight savings messes things up. Tremendously. We all hate daylight savings. Too. All my homies hate daylight savings. Although Pilk, I don't know what it is. Too scared to find out. Uh, Pilk is just Pepsi and milk. Plus the acronym Pilk. I can't imagine it tastes good. But uh, you never know. I haven't tried it, so... I can't... say. Which it probably doesn't. Interesting. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Probably doesn't taste good. I don't know how it came about. Someone probably liked it. I think we can do this way. Yes. Wait, I have to type the commands. Raid. Raid. Two? Yes. We should go raid Erin. Uh,. The chug jugging milk drinker, which is a scary sentence. I will return next week. 
at the same time relative to me and I will see you all later and I hope you have good evenings mornings afternoons whatever time it may be for you and yeah that's it bye bye